bench here. We're, we're, we're rolling, Mike. Oh, geez. <laughs> this is an interview <laughs> with Kim Bennett, the Microtel Inn, Auburn, New York, the 24th of September, 2003, approximately 1.30 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give us your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, Kim Morgan Bennett. Uh, I was born 11 20, 1951. And I was born in Cortland, New York. I lived for 18 years in Groton, New York, before I joined the military. Okay. Um, could you tell us, uh, were you enlisted or did you were you drafted? Well, <laughs> it's I was going to college at TC3, Tom's Court Community College down, at the time it was in Groton, it's in Dryden now. Uh, I left my deferment for a month, at which time, about two days after I lost it, my number got pulled, my selective service number, which was 98 at the time. So I decided I didn't want to go to Vietnam, so I joined, went to the Air Force recruiter in Cortland and asked him what my chances were to go to Vietnam, which he stated one in a million. He was wrong. I didn't know. I kept asking, where's the million people in the Air Force? There wasn't any. Um, so what I did is, this was 1971, they sent me down to San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base for my initial basic training. And at the time they didn't guarantee you what your career field would be. Mm -hmm. So I, they said apply for four things, you'd get your top four, one of your top four. I applied for air traffic controller, uh, fire crash, or crash fire. Uh, regular fireman and computer data processing because that's what I was going to college for. Well, in the Air Force's wisdom, they decided to make me a security policeman. At the time, I didn't really like cops too much, and I couldn't believe they made me a security policeman. And they were going to send me to AR, the Little Rock AR, which I at the time I thought was Arizona, but it had to be Arkansas. So I was in for kind of a shock, and then they sent me to a SAC base, which was all mainly missiles, mm -hmm. Titan twos, where we flew out in helicopters every day and stayed out for three days at a time and then come back. And we had different, like, six different sections of missiles. Each section had five missiles, and our job was to keep them secure and check on the crews. Each missile had their own crew, which were about 80 feet underground. And then, uh, yeah, how, what kind of specialized training did you receive? Uh, oh, most of mine was on the job training at the time. We were supposed to go to, at the time, the Air Force Tech School for Security Police was at Sheridan Air Force Base in Illinois. But they, for some reason, they were over full, and uh, they sent us straight to Arkansas, which was short security policemen. So they did on the job training right there. We had uh, classroom training plus doing the job at the same time mm -hmm. and being uh, critiqued by our supervisors. Um, besides that, uh, I I had a real bad attitude when I first got in there. I refused to, you know, get haircuts. I refused to salute female officers because I felt like I got shafted. I mean, here I was going to college and they always said, you know, you're supposed to suit the officers respect because they went to college and, you know, you're supposed to respect them. Well, at the time I was, you know, well, this is a chauvinist pig probably, I would call it. And so I didn't, I sued the officers, men officers, but I wouldn't sue female officers. And I got in trouble quite a bit for that. I think my wing commander, he kind of understood it, but I had to go see him quite often for refusing to do it. But I was lucky, I worked out in the midst of most of the time, so I didn't really run into too many people. Uh, plus, my mother's cousin, he was stationed there, and I got to see him once in a while. He was a uh, one-star general and everything. And then, uh, it was the October 71, uh, the Air Force decided to go send me down back to Lackland for uh, what they call AZR training, which is Combat Preparedness School. I should have thought something was going on at the time, but I didn't think, I just thought it was, you know, something we were supposed to do for our field. 
So we went to Camp Bullis, Texas, where we had Army instructors. They set up a VC camp and an Air Force base, you know, simulations. And our job was, for the weeks we were there, to some people pretend they were VC and some pretended they were security police protecting an Air Force base. And we would attack each other with use of blanks and simulators, mm -hmm. you know, artillery simulators, hang and simulators. We had to do some live action firing exercises where we had a low crawl or uh, 50 cal machine gun fire, which was locked in place 48 inches over our head. You know, as long as you didn't stand up, you were okay. And you crawled through a minefield. As long as you, the minefields were, where they were said they had like a fence around it, so you wouldn't be able to get into, you know, go in the mine hole. And then you had uh, a choice of three things you would like to specialize in. Mine was machine guns from the M60, the BAR, and the 50 cal machine gun, and uh, mortars, the 60, the 81, and uh, booby traps, which I took a real good interest in booby traps. I listened a lot better in that class than anything else. I don't know why, because I didn't even know I was going to Vietnam then. And uh, I got back, I think it was the end of November, right after Thanksgiving. My commander called me in there, and this is 1971. The war is supposed to be winding down. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls me in and he just wanted to congratulate me. And I crashed me for what? He says, well, you go over to Vietnam and stop the war. I thought, I thought he was joking, because his name was Captain James Bond. I always remember that, and we always mm -hmm. joked with him a lot. And we always called him 007. But he says, no, it's no joke. You're going to Vietnam. Here's your orders. Well, that night, I kind of was in self-pity, I guess you call it. I got drunk and called my girlfriend up and talked to her father. We got a fight on the phone and everything else. And I finally, yes, I passed out or something. I woke up the next morning, the commander called me back in his office. He said uh, he had some more orders for Vietnam. And what it was, is like 12 of us went through basic together, and uh, we all went through AZR training, and we came back, and when I got more that night, these other guys kind of rigged me a lot about going to Vietnam. Well, the commander said I could pass out their orders to them. So that day I went out and passed out 11 more sets of orders to the same guys, so we all went together. It wasn't kind of very, it wasn't very pleasant. I mean, a lot of people didn't want to go. I didn't want to go mm -hmm. and everything, you know. That's one reason I joined the Air Force. I kept saying, you know, it's supposed to be a million, one in a million chance of me going. That's what I was told. So, I think it was December, the end of December, that I went home on leave. I think I came around if I take 30, 45 days leave. And that's, I think February 8th, I shipped out to Vietnam out of uh, Travis Air Force Base in California. I flew Continental over, which kind of amazed me. I flew a civilian flight over. When you uh, did the civilian flight, you were in uniform. Did you receive any harassing or uh, any comments while you were in uniform? Or? Well, I flew from Syracuse in my class A uniform. I got mm -hmm. lucky. I went to the bathroom. I met Chuck Connors, mm -hmm. and the rifleman. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in, in Syracuse. Some and he asked me if I was coming back from Vietnam. I said, no, I was going to go. And he shook my hand. He was a big guy. And uh, my mom and dad saw him out in the lobby, and they, were, they couldn't talk. They just, you know, they were mm -hmm. in shock. <laughs> but I got on the plane. I had, a, I had dress blues on. We stopped Chicago. We didn't switch planes. We stayed on the same plane. And we flew into San Francisco. And I was supposed to San Francisco. I was catch a bus down to Travis. Well, in San Francisco, I met a lot of war pro protesters. And... Uh, they said a lot of things to me and called me baby killer. And I said, I hadn't gone yet. I said, mm -hmm. what are you, you know, well, it's just because I was in uniform and everything. And one thing that before this, before when I was getting ready to go to school, college, I was a bartender in Groton. And a friend of mine, well, a friend I went to school with, his brother, older brother had gone to Vietnam and a couple older friends of mine had gone to Vietnam. And they come back, and this one friend of mine, he was going to regular college. And I asked, I says, uh, didn't you go to Vietnam? He goes, yeah. 
He says, wait, we're going to college together. He goes, yeah, but he asked me not to tell anybody in college that he had gone to Vietnam. And I said, you know, I was patriotic, very patriotic. I, mm -hmm. I, I felt that, uh, you know, this guy for service, he, people should look up to him. I wasn't really looking at the news at the time and seeing all the protestings, you know, Kent State mm -hmm. and all this stuff. I heard about it, but I wasn't really into the thing. And I thought my town was pretty well patriotic. So, you know, I did what he wished, and a couple of the guys told me to tell him, I didn't tell anybody that they went to Vietnam, and that's where I stayed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I got to Travis, I flew back, I, I kept thinking about that. I figured, you know, well, maybe the war will end and things will change. And uh, we flew over Continental. The, the, the airlines was pretty nice to us. I mean, they were really nice. Mm -hmm. I had no problem with them. The stewardesses were nice and everything. So you flew right into Vietnam. Uh, we flew in. Uh, we flew into Guam, then into uh, Clark Air Force Base in Philippines. We stayed there for two days, and uh, and then we flew out. It was another Continental aircraft, different crew, but mm -hmm. same kind of airlines. And then we flew into Nha Trang, Vietnam, and then from Nha Trang, I was shipped down to uh, Tan Son Nhut in Saigon mm -hmm. and stuff. What was your assignment there? Uh, I was assigned to a flight of the 377th uh, Security uh, Police Squadron, which at the time a flight was uh, basically, um, uh, what do you call it, not airport security, flight line security, where we had to man bunkers out on the perimeter of the Air Force Base and stuff. I eventually got switched over to uh, the armor part where I became a commander of a uh, V-100, which is uh, like an amphibian vehicle. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but it's on wheels. It's 10 tons. Oh, yes. I, I know what you mean, yes. And, and from there, and I did a lot of odd jobs. We had, uh, the Army was pulling out, the Marines were pulling out, the Air Force basically was Getting towards the last, except for a couple covert units and uh, the embassy guards, and we had to pick up their slack. There's times I did door gunning for the army on helicopters, and I did a lot. Of, well, three or four uh, down aircraft securities in the jungle. I spent a lot of convoys. So that's how I got hurt was in a convoy and stuff. What happened to you? Uh, we were in a middle convoy, and at the time I was working as a door gunner for the helicopters. What kind of helicopter were you on? It was Huey H ones, mm -hmm. um, and I had to go down. and One of our M60s was in the shop getting repaired, so they said they told me to go down, and pick up Mars, and pick up a couple other helicopter crews' uh, weapons and stuff. And I had what they call regular straight leg Jeep, a 151 Jeep, and where it doesn't have anything. Where the MPs had 50 cal jeeps which had lead bottoms on them so they could support the 50 cal because if you don't 50 cal would shoot and turn the jeep right over. Well we were, I had gone on Tansanu, we picked up, I picked up the weapons and stuff, had them in the back and we are heading out in a convoy going back to ben, towards Benoit and uh, on the way there the lead vehicle I think was either a gas truck or an ammo truck but we always put our slowest vehicles in the front. And we were, we were clipping along pretty good. I'd say about 50. So we usually go top speed what that vehicle can do. And I had an MP Jeep in front of me and an MP Jeep behind me. What happened is the first vehicle took it, got an RPG round and it blew up. And we all come to a screeching halt. And as I slammed on the brakes, I come up and I just hit the bumper of the MP Jeep in front of me. Well, the MP Jeep behind me, the 50 cal gunner, he saw where the RPG came from, so he started opening fire. Well, the driver, Hearing the fire up and looked to see where he was firing at and stepped on the gas. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize the convoy had stopped and ran to my Jeep, caused my Jeep just to bend like an accordion, flipped me forward over the steering wheel, then flipped me back so hard that I broke the seat. And as I did, the machine gun come up, landed on my chest and my neck, and I was pinned there. Well, the driver that hit me got out of his Jeep because there was bullets, wings all over the place, and he pulled me out. And put me on the ground, and they 
medevac me down to a third field medical hospital where I was a neurosurgeon, but the neurosurgeon had already left. This was like October 72. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I had neck pains and back pains and stuff, but they were, everybody was shipping out, and the doctors were shipping out, and we're, everything's just winding down. And when I got there, it was like 250,000 troops there. When I left, there was like 2,000 of us. And the highest ranking person was an E7. There wasn't even any officers left. And uh, so I said, you know, I just told him, I said, well, I was in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force for four years. So I still had a little less than two years left to go that I'd have the doctors look at it when I got back. Which, I don't know, it just, I never really had looked at it too much. Mm -hmm. You know, I just kind of forgot it. I tried to forget the war. And, mm -hmm. Do you ever, does it ever bother you at all? Or? Well, the only reason I even wrote to you is because I forgot, I've, when I got back from Vietnam, I took all my uniforms, I gave them away, I gave all my stuff away. Um, I was lucky I held on to my DD-214, I almost threw that away. The only reason I held on to that because I got in a car with a guy and I left it in the car and he kept his car and I just happened to go down and get it one day. But what was going on, I, used, I worked at Thomas County Sheriff's Department as a correction sergeant down there. I was having a lot of problems with my a female supervisor. We were real close friends at one time and then I stuck up on, for another female she hated and she turned on me and um, I had to go through a lot of arbitrations because she kept trying to write me up and everything. I kept winning all my arbitrations so she thought that she'd look into my application for being to work in there, which you know, I've been there for almost three some years, three or four years. And uh, they looked at my application, her and the undersheriff said that, uh, so I marked in there that I would be in Vietnam so I could get the Vietnam service credits for civil service. And uh, they said, well, they didn't say anything to me. They wrote to the U.S. Army requesting that they did not believe that I went to Vietnam, <coughs> that they think I falsified my application and stuff. You know, and I didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. and, but, and then one of the dispatchers, a fax came through one of the dispatchers and they showed me the fax. It was a response from the Army. Plus the Army wrote me a letter saying that somebody was investigating mm -hmm. my uh, military career. And the Army responded back to them stating that they, they had to have my signature mm -hmm. and stuff. So I went, you know, it kind of upset me. You know, at first I wasn't going to do anything, but then I started getting nightmares. I mean, I had control of them. I mean, I'd forgotten, I'd almost forgotten my whole service career. You know, I was starting a whole new life, a civilian and stuff, and I just, you know, I got a really thing that reminded me even of the service, period, alone in Vietnam. I mean, I've had, I had what I call bad dreams. Some people call them flashbacks, but I call them bad dreams, mm -hmm. nightmares. And uh, this kind of set it off again. So I finally just went into the undersheriff. It was just before I wrote to you guys. And uh, I asked him, what, what's the deal? You know, why'd you do this? Oh, he said, I already took care of it. They had gone down to an army recruiter, and they had taken, um, they had a copy of my DD-214 from the Army, and it has all my awards on it. And they had taken my awards, and you know, uh, like a, on the DD-14, and had a recruiter look at it. Well, he said my Vietnam campaign, Vietnam service medal were in the wrong position. So that even upset me. So I wrote to the Army, asking them about it, and they wrote me regulations. They told me, don't listen to this idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. They gave me their article. Everything was right, which I thought it was in the first place. But see, this, this, them doing this brought back a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, it felt like what it was when I got off the plane coming back from Vietnam. I had my ribbons ripped off me, a bag of shit thrown at me. I had to change uniforms in San Francisco because I landed back in Travis and bust up to San Francisco. Before I even got in the airport, I was attacked with a bag of crip shit, hit me right across the chest, and then some ball-headed guy come over and grabbed my ribbons and ripped right off. So, you know, and I didn't have no civilian clothes. I was like, yeah, I had those. I mean, when we left Vietnam, we left in our, our uh, utilities or camouflage uniforms because they had shipped all our stuff it was supposedly in the Philippines mm -hmm. and then we land in the Philippines it wasn't there, it says it was supposed to be in Okinawa we went to Kadena, Okinawa, it wasn't there finally it was in Yakamoto, Japan we found our stuff 
when we got to switch over. And I had two TW for like uh, Tans. Mm -hmm. I had two of those. I put one on, and that one got thing. When I got to San Francisco, one in the bathroom, I put the other one back on. And I asked, uh, I knew there was all kinds of name callings and stuff like that when I was getting my ticket. So I asked the stewardess when I got on the plane if I could sit way in the back where nobody would see me, you know. And uh, they, they, they were pretty good about it. It was American Airlines. They, they put me in the, way in the back. You know, and there wasn't that many people on the plane anyways, and uh, we had to stop in Chicago. And before I left San Francisco, they asked me if I wanted something to drink. And before I went over to Vietnam, it was like you were allowed two drinks per stop. But when I got back, they said, you can have as many as you want. So, you know, I just started drinking. Every time I fly, I drink scotch and water. I don't know why. It's the only time I ever drink scotch back then. It's just something strong, I guess. I had like a fear of flying. I mean, I could fly in helicopters all day, don't mind. You put me in a jet, though, it would drive me crazy. Um, but they, uh, they were nice when they kept giving me drinks. We landed in Chicago, finally had more drinks. I didn't, we didn't have to switch planes, land in Detroit. By then, I was pretty well drunk. I, they asked me if you wanted more drinks before we took out, you know, or before we take out the one serve unless you're in the air. And I said, yeah, I ordered two more. And, uh, I passed out. They woke me up when we were in the air between Detroit and Syracuse. And uh, they asked me, well, you want, we, we can refund your money and give you drinks, you know, take the drinks back. I said, no, that's fine, you know. And then by then, there was hardly anybody on the plane. I had like four stewardesses back then. And they were asking me all kinds of questions about Vietnam. They were really nice to me. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, they were really nice. And, you know, being in the service, you have a tendency to forget, especially being in the been around women, American women, for like 13 months, 12, 13 months. And I was kind of vulgar, and I kept apologizing for my language. And they said, oh, that's okay, you know, and I said, because I had a couple sitting next to me and a couple were in front of me leaning over the things. And when we landed in Syracuse, it was March, you know, it's snowing out, and you know how New York winters are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they barely even got into the airport. And when we landed, it was like, I think, two or three o'clock in the morning. Well, I bet I made a mistake. I didn't call anybody, let anybody know I was coming home. So I hear I'm sitting in the airport, and all I got is khakis. The flight crew, they gave me a, a blanket, American Airlines blanket to take with me, to keep me warm. I, I felt so proud, I wouldn't even put it on me. I just carried it underneath me, in this little pack, you know, because these people are so nice to me. So I go in the airport, the first thing I'm, you know, I'm on defensive. I'm afraid somebody's going to think, but there was hardly anybody there. You know, just people cleaning up and stuff. So um, I got there and I'm standing there and I get my luggage, well, just a duffel bag. And I look around and it dawns on me, there's nobody here because I didn't, nobody knows I'm home. Mm -hmm. So I tried to call my parents' house. They had gone someplace, I guess, for like a second honeymoon or something. I, tried, I didn't know where my sister was living. So I finally got a hold of a friend of mine, Russ Newman. And uh, he came up and got me in a TR6 <laughs> in the middle of the winter. <laughs> I said, here, we strapped my uh, duffel bag on a ski rack in the back of it. And he drove me home and dropped me off at my house. We got home, I got home about 6 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep. Um, my parents had rented out my room, my parent, and my sister's room. And I walked in, and I didn't know there was anybody. I didn't know my parents' car. There was no cars in the parking lot except for my car. Mm -hmm. You know, it had a canvas over it. And I didn't know there was there. So I'm walking around making all kinds of noise, you know, looking for dinner. So I found a beer, started drinking a beer and stuff, you know, and so I had to go to the bathroom, our bathroom's on our stairs, so I go, I did the stairs, go to the bathroom, and I'm whack, I get hit right in the head, my own house, I'm sitting there like this, and all of a sudden somebody jumps on top of me, and they're wrestling with me and everything else, and it was two girls, and I'm sitting there, I finally fight my way out, and I get over, I run out to the living room, I'm in, right in front of the fireplace, and here comes a lady, a girl, she's in her 20s, she's got a golf club in her hand, she's in a negligee, another girl comes out, She's got a baseball, my baseball bat, <laughs> in her hand. And all of a sudden, this little girl comes around and goes, Daddy, 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 and grabs me by the leg. And I'm just like freaking. I'm just going, oh, my God. And all of a sudden, I look to the right, and here comes a state trooper busting through the kitchen door with a 357, looking right down there. And he said, I survived Vietnam. I'm going to die in my own house. <laughs> I said, I couldn't believe it. He says, you move, you're dead. Well, it happened that the state trooper was going with the 20-year-old, and she had called him. 
and stuff. And I didn't know my parents around the place out and stuff. So finally I told him, I said, look at hey, who you are. And I said, my picture's here, right here. And you can see, you know, this is me. I've been in the service. I just got back from Vietnam, everything. And then you know, everything finally settled down and stuff. And my parents, I didn't see my parents for the next two days because so they didn't come mm -hmm. home and stuff. But, and I thought, you know, <clears throat> since I just got Vietnam and this was at the end, we had the peace treaty, 73, January 73 and everything. and. Well, you know, we'll probably get a big homecoming because it's over with. It was worse. I mean, my hometown, I thought, was really patriotic. Everybody went to school, they shunned me. Every time, you know, hey, where you been? I always oh, just got back from Vietnam. It's like, people just moved away. The only ones that actually just got away with were younger kids that were maybe, you know, five, six years younger than I was. But they only hang around with me. And after a while, I just started telling me, you know, while I was in Germany, you know. I wouldn't do this, and you know, I was getting drunk, I was getting into drugs. And I was home on leave for, I was still in the Air Force, and I was home on leave for 75 days. The Air Force gave me free leave, which was really nice of them, and everything. And then I was, I was supposed to go up to Lauren Air Force Base, Maine, another SAG base, but it was B-52s, which I went up there in April. And spent the rest of my time until January 75 in the service up there. And I got out. Bartender for a while. I didn't really actually. I really didn't want to get out. At this time, my attitude had changed. I started out with a bad attitude. Now I got a good attitude. You know, I mean, I like the military. I actually got treated better in the military. You know, you kind of missed it. You know, you're home. Even home on leave, you wanted to leave, go back in. You know, because people weren't treating you it was great. And uh, a lot of my Vietnam buddies were up there. They split our our squadron in half. Half went to uh, Maine. Half of them went to Plattsburgh. And you know, my roommates, which mates, I'd say. Went to were up there, and one of my best one of my best friends. He was he got wounded in Vietnam, and uh, he was he had a room already for me and everything when I got there. You know, and it's just like we were like a clique. All the Vietnam guys to stay together, where anybody else came in, we kind of pushed them away from us. You know, and uh, like ever since this incident, when I, I saw your advertisement. I can't remember if it was in the paper. I think it was in the paper. And then some of the sheriff's department, I decided to write to you. I've been seeing a VA counselor since uh, July of 2001 for post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was there today. I go every every two weeks. Mm -hmm. I've been going for the last two years. And I usually go on Wednesdays, 9, 10. Now, when did you go into the Army? I went in the Army, of, I listed in the Army on the delayed program of August 1976. Mm -hmm. So you stayed in for 16? 16, 16 years, yeah. Why did you decide to go back in? I originally didn't want to get out of the Air Force, but the Air Force, they give you a re-enlistment slot. Mm -hmm. And you have to respond within 30 days, you get that slot. Well, they sell my slot to a different Bennett. So after about six days, I went into the re-enlistment office and they asked me, I said, look, at, I haven't gotten a re-enlistment slot. Have I been barred from re-enlistment or what? And they told me, no, no, we sent it out. And I said, well, can I see the address you sent it to? Because I never received it. And they go, mm -hmm. yeah. And they showed me the address and it was a different Bennett. And uh, so I went to that guy. Well, he just came in. He was an airman and he had ripped it up and threw it away. Didn't think anything of it. So and I went back to him and told him, said, well, we've already given up your slot. We can't do nothing about mm -hmm. it. So they told me, get out from at least 90, you know, 190 days to come back in. I tried 18 times to come back in the Air Force. 18 times. They told me they'd have to bus me down from E4 down to E1. I'd have to go through basic camp training. Had to go back through. Had to go through tech school. I said, No, no, I can't do that. I don't. You know, I mean, I've been in. You know, I'm like 22, 24, going on 24 years old or something. And I said, No, I can't do that. So finally, I got so fed up. I called the Air Force recruiter a bunch of names and everything. I walked out. And Army recruiter heard me in Cortland, and I went out. And I started going out the door, and he stopped me. He goes, "Hey, wait, why don't you come and talk to me for a minute?" And I says, uh, "Well, let me go outside and have a cigarette and think about it." He says, "Well, I'll join you." So we went out and had a cigarette, and we talked, and then I went back in. And he told me, "Look, I can give you E4. You go through Minuteman School, which is just two weeks of refreshing boot camp. We'll send, you don't have to go through." Uh, t uh, MP school if you don't want to. I said, well, I'd rather go through it because I, mean, I don't know what the difference between the SPs and the MPs were. Mm -hmm. the SPs were more, where I was doing was more security and stuff, where 
The MPs were more law enforcement. So he talked me into it. And at least August, I was getting ready to go. To, I was going to go to Korea. But then they had the hatchet killings there, mm -hmm. and so I said, "Well, I don't want to go right back into another war." So I went back and I changed it to Panama. <laughs> Wasn't much better. But so, well, at that time it was Canal Zone. Mm -hmm. So they shipped me down. And I had to wait for a top secret clearance and everything because. I went through the two-week Minuteman course in Missouri at Fort Leonard Wood, and then I went down to uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama, and went through uh, what they call uh, AIT, MP school, AIT, and they gave me the option, and he says, well, you can test out, since you've already been in school, test out. So I tested out every course, and I was done in like two weeks, but I had to stay there almost three more months because I had to wait for clearance. So I had a top secret clearance in the Air Force and they wanted to give me another top secret clearance for the MPs. So I waited until March of uh, 77, got my clearance, they sent me down to Panama, where I spent three years down there. And uh, TDY a lot to Colombia, Honduras, Costa Rica, mostly fighting. We were doing a lot of stuff with Special Forces and DEA, drug enforcement, stuff like that. Plus we had a lot of trouble at the time with uh, the dictator Torrios mm -hmm. and a lot of riots. We did a lot of riot control. Um, I don't know if you want to get more into my army career or not. Well that's you know, part of... Uh, I, was, I got married in 78 from a girl up here. Cause I met her when I was, got out of the, between going into the services and stuff. We've been married a little over 25 years. Got two daughters and stuff. My first daughter was born in Panama. And everything. We came down there, and we liked it. Actually, we liked it down there. We liked it a lot. My wife liked it. My daughter liked it. Mm -hmm. Then, it was eighty. I got shipped up to uh, Walter Reed. I stayed there for about eighteen months. Where I, I did a stateside swap to Seneca Army Depot. And I was, I was still in E4. Up there, I had a female lieutenant who was a West Pointer, Nancy Swoboda. Real good, nice looking, really good. She knew her stuff. She was one of the first females to go through West Point. And uh, she promoted me to corporal, then she promoted me to E5, and then she promoted me to E6, all within a two-year span. Mm -hmm. And that's where I stayed the rest of the time I was in service at E6. I think a lot of us, because I was a Vietnam veteran, I used to, I called uh, the Pentagon, talked to uh, Sergeant Major Adams up there, and he told me that what they do is when they get Vietnam vets, they put them in a pile and they take one Vietnam vet out for promotion and leave the rest. So, you know, unless he said the only other thing you do is start advancing is, you know, start going, trying to take courses and stuff. So what I did, I started taking uh, uh, infantry courses. And I got my second MOS as a Love and Bravo infantry by taking all their courses and stuff. I was, getting, I was going to try for an IB infantry badge. I didn't quite get that far, though. But my secondary MOS was a Love and Bravo. Usually MPs get secondary MOS as a 95 Charlie, which is a corrections officer. I didn't want that though. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let's see, Seneca, from Seneca Army Depot, I went to Germany for two years. Came back, went to Fort Dix, did a lot of TDY from Fort Dix. To Costa Rica from there, went down to uh, Fort Stewart, Fort McPherson for security, because I had top secret clearance, so they used me in all these top secret detail things. I had a top secret, uh, I'd gone to courier, courier school where I could carry, you know, the bag with the handcuffs. Mm -hmm. Couldn't read any of the stuff, but most of it was in crypto. Uh, then went back down to Panama in 1987. Got down there just in time for Just Cause. And it wasn't because I wanted to be there, but mm -hmm. I mean, I enlisted to go down there and me and my wife, I didn't know what stuff was going on. This time it was with Noriega. Mm -hmm. And we went through a lot of stuff down there, and due to my combat career, since I was one of the few combat veterans for Vietnam, which they consider a combat veteran, that they uh, used me when I come to, uh, you know, they thought would be a combat situations and stuff. Like one, for instance, one time we were going, there was a coup. And we were supposed to go down, and we had to go down to Panama City and get this major's family out and get them to an uh, air pad and get them, you know, fly back to the United States. And uh, our pro general went to the provost marshal, 
was a colonel, come down to my camp, come commander, and uh, he told me, he asked, I guess he asked the commander who was, if he had any uh, combat veterans, back, back then it was just mainly Vietnam veterans. Even. So and they said, yeah, they picked me, and I had to go see the general and the colonel, and he, they told me to pick 20 people that I could trust, which basically I just took most of them out of my platoon. And it was all top secret, and uh, me and my platoon sergeant, my platoon leader, my company commander, my first sergeant, didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, when I, you know, when I had to speak to was either the general or the colonel. And we went down, we did what we were supposed to do, we got these people out, got them, since we got them a helicopter, got them shipped back to the United States. Uh, but we went, and everybody kept asking, we, we were given strict orders not to say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if we did, you know, you wouldn't get busted, you'd go on court martial. It was a direct order. Um, my company commander, my first sergeant, my platoon leader, and my platoon sergeant, they just couldn't understand that. And they would drill the people that I went, went down with. And the people would come to me and say, look, we're being harassed. They want to know what we're doing, what we did, and stuff like this, and we can't tell them. And I finally went to the colonel and I told him, I said, look, they, they keep harassing us. I mean, I like the company, I like the first, I like my platoon, mm -hmm. but they just kept constantly. They couldn't understand why we couldn't tell them. Mm -hmm. I, in a way, I couldn't understand it either. I mean, to me, it was just a simple operation mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, the company commander had been relieved of duty and stuff over the whole situation. In other instances, uh, we were doing a lot of TDYs to Honduras because we had a lot of reservists and National Guard down there. And, they wanted MPs up there to protect their convoys, plus we were doing, uh, protecting a CIA site up in uh, Tiger Island. And I've been to Honduras, when I was, first time I was Honduras, I've been there about five times, first time I was in Panama. This time I went up there, and most time it was Tiger Island. This time we had Humvees, which they just came out with, and the MP country didn't want to use our Humvees for a convoy escorts. They were using blazers and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and they weren't very well bulletproof, and they were getting attacked by what we called at the time was terrorists and stuff. So I had strict orders not to let them use my Humvees. If they wanted convoy security, they would use me. Mm -hmm. And I went up, first we went up with the lieutenant in charge. Well, they called the lieutenant back and they put me in charge. And then they, we were there for like two months and we came back. And they sent me back with another platoon with me in charge. And we were doing convoy securities. And then I, we came back, they sent a platoon from the Atlantic side, 549th, for a lieutenant. Well, he got two people got killed. So I had to go up and relieve him and take another platoon up because he wouldn't follow orders. During, when you got to an installation, you stayed there, you didn't let your people go off the installation. He let his people go off and this, somebody threw a hand grenade at him and killed two of his people. So that's, they made me, basically, because I had combat experience and I did a, you know, I did what I was supposed to do to protect my people and protect the convoys. So basically they were using me a lot, you know, for this. But you know, I didn't mind doing it. I mean, I was away from my family quite a bit, which was hard. And uh, I was worried about it a lot of times because the stuff in Panama was going on. and I wasn't there for that half the time. And when I was, most of the time I wasn't at home because we had stuff going on with a PDF in Noriega constantly. And so I was kind of, upset with that. Plus I wasn't getting promoted. I mean I was an E6 for up until I retired. And I tried everything, you know. I didn't have time to go do college courses. I mean I tried the infantry courses, what they call, um, I can't remember, where they send you the booklets and you read and do the test. You send them back in to give you your scores and stuff. And that's what I was doing. I was having time doing that. You know, and they have family time and stuff. Most of the time we work 12 hour shifts. So you didn't have too much time for family. And I love, we really liked Panama and stuff. So there was you know, more incidents where they put me in charge. Like we were supposed to start the war August 11, 1989 with a, a PDF in Amador. They put me in charge of a platoon with 450 cows aimed at their barracks across the golf course. PDF had the right side of Amador and we had the left side and the golf course in between. And we had set up 50 cals, and what it was, our, my uh, female platoon leader was supposed to, she was Puerto Rican, she was supposed to start a fight with a Panamanian officer at the main gate. 
and try to get him to shoot her. Where we had a E7 as a sniper was going to take out him before he got sh before she got shot, because PDF don't take orders from females. Mm -hmm. Well, she got in a fight with him. PDF punched her and knocked her down. She's supposed what she's supposed to do is grab her weapon to make him grab his, and that's when the sniper was And when we heard the shot, we we're supposed to open up. Well, she got scared. She kept getting up. He kept punching her. He kept up, punching her. And she would never grab her weapon. He never grabbed hers. Finally, they just got her out of there. And because she got scared, she didn't think that our sniper would be fast enough to shoot mm -hmm. him, you know, or be accurate enough. So we had more than a couple more incidents in October where we got surrounded by the PDF because they in Corundu they. Uh, captured a couple of our MPs, and we went in with Humvees, and we got surrounded, and then the Marines came in with a little bit labs, they got surrounded. Finally, I had a Cobra come over and stood right above my head. Most securing thing I ever saw, because I had, hey, like 10 snipers around me. I was sitting on top of the Humvee with an M60, and uh, I just took, told that Cobra on the radio, don't move, please, don't move. <laughs> <laughs> he sat right there, and then finally the seventh mech, or the fifth mech from Fort Polk, was about, 80 tracks come right through Noriega's forces. No sh the only shot was fired. One Marine accidentally fired a um, 40 mic mic and it blew a palm tree up because he fell and he grabbed the trigger. And that was the only one. Noriega was down there taunting, taunting us and everything. Come on, I'm right here, shoot me, you know. Which we didn't know if for sure it was him or not because a lot of times he had, he was like, uh, Saddam was saying he'd have doubles and stuff. So we didn't know. But and from there, after Just Cause, I was we were shipped up to Fort Carson, Colorado, where I stayed until '92 when I retired. Then I did TDYs there. Went back to Germany. Went to Texas for mostly reforger, because I was this is where my computer data processing from college came in, because I knew how to do computers and everything switched. As the army got modernized, we all switched to computer games. Mm -hmm. So I was basically in charge of the MP forces on the computer. But yeah, you know, it was easy. To me it was easy. Some people it was hard, but stuff. And I don't know, is there anything else you want to know? Has your have your feelings about being in Vietnam ever changed? How do you feel about your service there? I've had mixed feelings about it. I first I've tried to get you know, just deal not even you know, just forget about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've seen a lot of stuff that's happened to other vets and stuff. And I know a couple of veterans that I used to work with, you know, and we, once in a while we sit down and talk. We weren't talking for anybody else, we just talked between ourselves. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I was mad because we left. I thought we left them in the South Vietnamese in a vulnerable situation, which we did. And uh, then sometimes I thought maybe we fought on the wrong side. Maybe we should have been on the North side or we been a quicker war, you know, because Ho Chi Minh, if you look at his background, he was a smart man, very smart, and uh, he was very educated. And he had the right idea. I just think that we jumped in where the French left off, and we should have probably thought about it a little bit harder before we jumped in and stuff. I mean, I thought the country was actually nobody shooting at you. It was pretty nice, you know. It was a beautiful country. I mean, I saw elephants. Saw a black panther, saw a lot of snakes that I want to see. Uh, water buffaloes, you know, a lot of rice paddies. Yeah. Do you think your service has affected your life in any way? Lately, see, I see it's, it's, well, when I wrote you guys the first time, it's changed my life. I mean, I got to the point where I almost I've had it hidden and everything. Now, I'm 70% disabled by the VA because if I, when I got hurt, my neck, 99 I started, or 97, I actually started, I started getting headaches and stuff. And the VA knew about it. When I got out of service, I went to the VA hospital in, in Syracuse, had a full, what they call, full medical run-up when you retire. Mm -hmm. When they told me, they said, you're going to have a problem with your neck. I said, did you get hurt? They said, well, I hurt my neck in Vietnam, my back and my neck and my knees. and um, they go, well, you gonna have problems with it. I said, well, can't you tell me that? No, you just got have problems with it. So in 97, I started getting wicked headaches. I couldn't, I couldn't have sex. I couldn't, I couldn't even go to the bathroom without having super headaches. Finally, I went to the doctors and they said, 
well as my neck, C5, C, between C4 and C7 of my uh, cervical spine was crushed. It's been that way for years. They said it was all calcium up and stuff. And the only thing I could think of was that accident. So I had, I had, two, I had a surgery in 99, January 99. Everything seemed good. The headaches went away. I felt great. Well, the doctor who performed surgery didn't do what he said he did. He put the plate in wrong. He didn't do. He was supposed to do a fusion. He took bone off my hip. He didn't do that. And then November 2000, right after, in fact, it was right after I worked you guys, I got in a fight with an inmate in uh, one of our holding tanks. He pulled the ceiling down on top of me. Hit me right across the neck here and right here by the light and uh, a big light fixture. And I had to go to the hospital. And like a couple weeks later, I couldn't swallow. I couldn't eat my food or nothing. What happened, it knocked loose the plate and pushed up against my esophagus and, I, and it just pinched off. I could breathe okay, I just couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. So January 2001, he did surgery, took the plate out, he says, hey, you're good to go, the fusion's great and everything. And then February, he lost his practice. So they told, my regular doctor told me to go to uh, another doctor from Syracuse and that doctor told me to get a lawyer because he said the guy was a quack. And uh, so he operated and put another plate in, did a f took C6 out, put a cadaver in, and uh, put another plate in, and headaches back. I'm numb, my fingers, hands, arms, shoulders, all the way down through, on both sides are numb. Like, you know, you they fall asleep and get that mm -hmm. tingling. It feels that way all the time for me. I have constant headaches. So I went back to the VA, the VA, they sent it to the, what they call the Tiger uh, group where they look over your medical records and they said it was service related and they gave me, well, all together they gave me 90% disability but f for job wise they made it 70%. I don't know what their deal, I don't know if you know their dealings with that or so, but that's what they did. They gave, I'm setting for disability. By federal government standards I'm 100% disabled. So I, I mean, collected, I collect the pension from the sheriff's department. Plus my my VA benefits came out of my retirement pay. I get a, like a hundred, a thousand ninety-five a month for VA and five dollars for retirement. Which right now they're doing the concurrent receipt thing, which it would help me out a lot. It could give me an extra thousand dollars back if they pass it. I don't know if they'll pass it or not. And uh, I get Social Security. That's the only thing. My wife works. I babysit and do house chores. Been doing that for since January 2001. It's the last time I worked. It's pretty boring. Yeah, so. Housework's not easy. I don't know how women no. do it. I never cut down a woman again. That's one thing I did in the military. My second time in, I went from a chauvinist pig to a equal rights for women. Mm -hmm. Woman wants to perform my job. She's welcome to it. You know, and I'll help her out as much as I want. You know, and they can help me out doing house chores. Uh, my wife works. My both my daughters work. They're they're in their twenties, and I got a grandson. That I babysit for him. That's about where I am right now. Just sit back, read the papers, iron clothes, wash clothes, make the bed, vacuum, wash windows, do the dishes, mow lawn. I do a man's thing too. I mow lawn. So. Did you ever join any veterans organizations at the all? Only, the only veterans organization I belonged to, I never joined. My father joined me up was the American Legion in Groton, mm -hmm. and I hardly ever go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably, the last three months I've probably been there one time and stuff. I'm not, I go to my counselor like every other Wednesday, and he wants me to go to group sessions, but I just, I don't want to. I just, you know, I mean, I talk to him privately and for an hour and that's it. And we go over late, we were just going over all my awards and medals, mm -hmm. showed them, I had to dig them all out. I didn't even know where they were, I had to dig them all out and stuff. Cause I got rid of everything. The only thing I got left is my Army Class A uniform and that's in mothballs put in my closet. Been there, I didn't even touched it. So, I have nothing from Air Force wise, except what I sent you guys for, for Vietnam, my DD-214, that's it. I got two of those, one from the Air Force, one from the Army. Do you ever watch any of the Vietnam movies or anything like that? Or? 
I didn't for a long time because I was worried, but then some of them I s started watching and I thought were kind of stupid because things that I didn't happen. I did watch a movie recently that I thought was real close to Vietnam and it's with Mel Gibson, uh, We Were Soldiers. Oh, yes. Okay. And I thought that was an excellent, excellent movie. And mm -hmm. it was hard sometimes, especially with all the shooting and stuff. You know, you kind of, you, mm -hmm. you moving around and stuff. And uh, I've, for some reason, I've been getting addicted to the History Channel. And, you know, I like, uh, you know, they're doing documentaries and stuff. And mm -hmm. you kind of, you know, looking, trying to see if there's people that went through the same thing I went through or, you know, close to it and stuff like that. But it's, for a long time, I wouldn't even watch that. It's just, since everything's, since November, to, or October 2000, actually, everything's just come back. It's changed my, it's kind of changed my life. It's gone from one point of not n remembering anything, you know, just forget the whole military service thing, and just going on with my civilian life, to all of a sudden back, here I am, no civilian life, back to the military. Mm -hmm. And basically that's where I am now. I mean, I get still have the nightmares more often now than I did before. And I blame that mainly on the sheriff's department because they mm -hmm. they doubted me and yeah, yeah. And stuff. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thanks.